Good morning, everyone. My name is Nick Macklin, and I'm refuting um, Alvaro Isla's uh, topic on uh, students being affected in their learning process and suffering due to uh, school cutbacks. Um, he has three main points. Uh, first of, uh, the type of cutback is affecting our students' learning experience. Second, uh, increase in school fees will affect students' learning. And three, the loss of teachers affects and hinders uh, students' learning experience. So I'm going to start off with the main point one. Um, the type, type, of, type of cutback is affecting our students' learning experience. Um, so at one point, uh, he was saying that, uh, that uh, Alvaro was saying that the cutbacks are making it to where classes are getting condensed down, um, specifically the arts and, uh, you know, like, so like art, music, um, and stuff like that, are getting condensed down. So he gave an example of three classes uh, being at one school being condensed into one. And um, he never really gave any statistical evidence to back that up. So uh, you know, I went on, I went on to find out because I mean, this is a hard one to refute because obviously we're all students and we've all seen the effect of it. But so I did did some research and found out on a website called bigfuture.collegeboard.org um, a list of uh, uh, high school classes, and he also was saying that the importance level of art classes are more than uh, both like English, math, science, all that. But the arts are more important. Than that. Um, so I found um, a list saying, saying uh, the importance level of each one, like gave a list in order of most important to least important. So it went English as number one, math number two, science number three, social studies number four, uh, foreign languages five, and finally the arts at six. And these are what colleges look at, uh, at an importance level. Um, so with that, and then also, uh, I found a statistic against the, uh, the, you know, classes being shrunk down to a size of three, or uh, size of one from three total classes. Um, there's a state law uh, for California. They have one for each state, um, but I just use California because that's most relevant to us. Um, that was on uh, that was on uh, students first. Um, it's the state policy card. Um, it said, under California, it says state laws still require uh, county stu superintendents to ensure that the average class size for grades 4 through 12 remain uh, 25 or below. Um, so, I mean, he, he was giving an example of like 40 to 50 students per class, and obviously that's illegal in the state of California. And uh, it varied from state to state, but for the most part, I mean, it, it kept the class numbers pretty low, and I mean, California is one of the high, has one of the highest uh, percentages class-wise. So, um, I don't know, 25 doesn't seem that big, especially when we started out with 20 in here, or watch, we started out with more than 20 in here, and we're down to 20 now. But, um, so, uh, for a second point, um, increase in school fees will affect the students' learning. Um, he went on about tuition fees, so that, that mainly goes to private, to private uh, high schools, and then also, uh, also you know, college level. Um, that doesn't really in any way affect our learning ability, because if you can afford to get into the school, learning's on you. So it really doesn't affect whether you're able to learn. It just affects whether you can get in or not. And uh, as a lot of you know, I mean, I use it, and I think most people here use it as a tuition assistance bog fee waiver. Uh, so that helps you get into school right there and pays, even gives you extra change to walk around with throughout the semester anyways. So I mean, uh, one of his main things was, you know, students are uh, less financially stable and apparently, I mean, like to me, like it, it, it's not a very sound argument to your learning ability. And then uh, thirdly, uh, the loss of teachers affects and hinders students' learning experience. I mean, that's one right there that I think we've all felt at some point or another. But uh, the flip side to that is uh, student, uh, teachers have the option of using teacher aides. And uh, the reason that they, they're getting rid of teachers is uh, just because of the financial cutbacks for the school. 
and aids are a lot less uh, expensive than an actual teacher itself. So when you are getting those bigger numbers of class in, in the classroom, uh, teachers have the option of using a teacher's aid, and uh, that's significantly cheaper and a lot of them work part time. So uh, depending on the lesson plan, they're there for you know a couple hours to support during that time frame and then move on with their day. So it's a lot more inexpensive for the actual school itself. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I mean, generally I do agree with uh, Alvaro's initial uh, main main claim, uh, but as as I stated before, with the evidence I provided, uh, it was just uh, not well argued, and there wasn't enough statistical evidence to back it up. And uh, thank you for listening. You don't need to stand there and wait for it. That's, that's uh, yeah. I do have something to say, but I don't usually say it when people are standing there because then you feel like a target and I'm shooting at you. Hang on a second. All right, well, you identify the proposition and the secondary points pretty clearly, so that's good. I want everybody to remember to do that, by the way, during your presentations when you're doing the debates. When you are getting involved in an argument and you're responding to what somebody else says, it's often important to say, you know, on this point, Ash made three claims, and I want to respond to those particular claims. If you can do that throughout the debate, it's so much easier to follow arguments over the course of a 50-minute discussion. So. Uh, one of the reasons that I appreciate everybody doing that so much is because I hope that it's good training for what you're about to do. Um, you signposted the individual points as you got to them. That was fine. There was an interesting challenge on the first point where you, in essence, say, well, the reason the arts are put lower, the advocates seem to suggest that they were of critical importance, but the truth is what colleges and universities look at, arts are on the bottom of the priority list. <coughs> So I think what your point is, you know, needs to be, you need to make a more declarative statement that says uh, when choices have to be made, the thing that ought to be the greatest benefit are the things that are most important to students that are going to help them the most when they get to college, and these are the things that are more important. Uh, which is not the same thing as saying it's unimportant, but saying you know all the schools are doing is they are prioritizing appropriately. Uh, and I think that that's ultimately where your claim comes out. <coughs> you make a reference to uh, California school law that requires that the student population can't be over a certain number. You want to make sure that that is uh, um, being followed if you if you can uh, demonstrate that that I, I think you need a, a specific citation you, you you had a vague citation it was like the California s school county superintendents are required to do this that part tell us where that is in the code so that we know because because you hear so many people say all oh, classes are overcrowded but the law says that they can't be overcrowded and here's what's going on by the way there was a later point that came up where you're talking about teachers' aides and that sort of thing, where are teachers? Where have teachers been laid off? Where are there fewer teachers in a school now, especially in California, than there were before? Did the advocates show any examples of that? That would be the first point to make. Is so what proof did they have yeah. that this was going on? And I don't remember that there was any proof. I think that would be your first argument. Second. It's probably not hard to find information that says, look, in 2005, the state of California employed uh, 700,000 teachers throughout the state. In 2015, they employed 950,000 teachers throughout the state. There are 250,000 more teachers 10 years later than there were before. Does that sound like we're losing a number of teachers? I mean, there, there are numbers like that. You, you need to be able to take 
information and apply it to the argument, not just uh, you know, be trapped by the information that the advocate presented, but you got to kind of go outside and find some other information. Uh, there are not fewer teachers in the state of California than there were before. There are plenty, and uh, the budgets, you know, they there was a period of time when the budgets were flat, but even when they were flat, they the layoff stuff that they put out, they always put that stuff out because they were legally required to. Teachers always got hired back. There were there were there were not big teacher layoffs, and so that's that's just not accurate information and you should point those things out and that's and that's not hard to find um, on the third point um, you, you, you kind of go to the teacher aid thing as an issue and I think that that's a little bit problematic I thought you had a good argument about the um, second point where you're talking about uh, tuition issues you say that really applies to private schools and to colleges so why are private schools not relevant to this particular argument and uh, colleges You've got a personal example that you're talking about. I don't know anything about this fee waiver thing. I wish I did because my kid went here for four or five years. She lollygagged around. What's the fee waiver that uh, she got? Uh, board, board, board of governors. Oh, Board of Governors. Do you have to have a, like a income requirement for that? Uh, yeah. Is that what it is? It's, okay. It's, it's an income thing. But All right. I mean, I, it's on my references if you want to take a look. No, no, no. I, I believe you. I, I no, mean, like I said, I just, I, what I th no, she's done. Uh, okay. No, 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 no. That's forever ago. <laughs> That's ancient history. When I when she was coming here and I was paying for it, that's when I would have worried about it. Yeah. Now, she's been gone for, well, I mean, I don't want to say it that way. She she left here a long time ago. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, but the um, uh, the idea is that are there people who want to go to college who are not able to go to college? And you're in essence saying. These fee increases are not really keeping people out of college because either they are relatively low to begin with or there are a whole bunch of waivers or there's a whole bunch of financial aid for people who really do have those kinds of problems. They can get some kind of assistance to, to do this sort of thing. So the idea that there are thousands of people who are being kept from going to school because of this, your argument is that that can't really be true because there are all these options available. And I like the example that you have. I just wish you'd been able to develop it a little bit more. Okay, thank you.